Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly. On this episode, I'm joined by Captain Josh Pfeiffer, 2020 Orvis endorsed freshwater fly fishing guide of the year and owner of Frontier Anglers. Josh shares his fly fishing journey and we take a deep dive into the trout angling opportunities in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, as well as smallmouth fishing in East Tennessee. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. But before we get to the interview, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating and review in the podcatcher of your choice. It really helps us out. We've also received several listener questions asking about the best way to support the show. In addition to subscribing in the podcatcher of your choice and leaving us a review, you can also support the show by using our affiliate link when you shop on Amazon. It doesn't cost a thing and we receive a small commission on your purchases. You can also become a Patreon patron and make a single or a recurring donation. Links to both of these options are in the show notes. There wouldn't be a show without listeners like you, and we appreciate your support more than you know. Now, on to the interview. Well, Josh, welcome to the Articulate Fly. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation, and we have a tradition on the Articulate Fly. We always ask all of our guests to share their earliest fishing memory. Okay. Um, I, w- I would say that my earliest memory would be um, my dad. was My dad was always a big fisherman. Um, never really fly fished, always bass fish, fish tournaments, you know, the uh, sparkle bass boats and things like that. Um, but he was, uh, he, he knew that I liked fishing rivers and, and we had watched shows on fly fishing. We'd watched trout fishing in, in Montana and whatever. And so I kind of got this urge to do it. Well, he took me to um, a trout farm um, up in Townsend, Tennessee. And, uh, but he never told me that we were going fishing. He took me and my brother. And I said, where are we going, Dad? He said, well, your mom wants us to go shopping. I said, shopping? He said, yes, yes, she needs us to go pick out new underwear. And I was like, that's that's what we're going to do on our weekend is go shop for underwear? So we're on the way, and I look back in the back, and there's rods. I said, Dad, why are there rods in the back? Because we had had one of those, you know, uh, uh, early 90s OJ Broncos. And he said, oh, that's, you know, me and me and uh, Rilo were fishing a tournament the other night, and I forgot to take him out, and I said, okay. And so the more we drive, I'm like, where are we going to get underwear? Like, all the way in Townsend. And so then he was like, you know, oh, by the way, we're not actually going shopping. Um, we're going to go catch some trout. And so uh, I, my mom actually still brings photos out from time to time of us going to the trout farm and you know it was one of those you pay by the fish and so later later on my dad would always tell me he's like man you guys had such a ball that day i just didn't have the heart to take y'all away um he said the thing is i just ran out of money i didn't have any more to give that guy because every fish you caught you were not allowed to throw back you had to pay for it and every fish was like five dollars and he said, I think I ended up spending like $250 on you kids <laughs> that day just just because we were just having a ball, you know, and it was one of those places that you didn't need anything but a gold hook. And that was that because they had never seen anything. And that's why he wanted you to keep every fish so that they never got smart. Because at least that's what he said. But yeah, and that was, I still remember it. I still got pictures of us, uh, uh, you know, my dad kind of teaching us how to reel fish in. We didn't quite get the hang of it, so we just walk up the bank and drag it. Um, so it was pretty awesome. My dad was cool like that. Yeah, that's pretty neat. So when did you kind of officially come to the dark side of fly fishing? Uh, it, it, so it wasn't long after that, uh, actually. It was probably seven, seven or eight, maybe. Um, we were uh, – it was, it was when uh, Walker K. Chronicles came out. It was like the first or second season of that show. And I, I just remember my dad every morning, you know, right before going to the lake, we would watch 
fishing shows, whether it was Jimmy Houston, Bill Dance, whatever. And I mean, my dad and I have always just been eating up with fishing. And then Walker K Chronicles came on, and you know they're they're somewhere in the Everglades fishing or, or fishing for bonefish. I can't remember what they're fishing for, but I just thought, oh my gosh, that's so cool! Sight fishing with a fly rod, um, and that was it. I was like, Dad, you know, I want to learn how to fly fish, and that kind of my dad not being a fly fisherman, um, he was you know. He said, well, I don't know anything about fly fishing. So I was like, well, can we not just like, you know, go somewhere and try it? And again, my dad being the the guy that he was, decided to go get a couple of cheap rods and, you know, had the old uh, rubber rubber hip boots. And he he took me up in the park and we tried a little bit and, and failed miserably. And it was on the way uh, back from one of those trips, we actually ended up stopping in at Little River Outfitters. And, you know, those guys were were cool and they were super helpful and really kind of helped us get started, picked out flies for us, showed us how to rig up leaders, um, tie on, tip it, everything. Um, Which the the tip it thing is another story. But we, uh, uh, after that, you know, living, at the base of the Smoky Mountains, we kind of got away from fishing the lakes. And my dad, you know, sort of got into the fly fishing thing and, and whatnot uh, and started spending more time up in the mountains, fly fishing the small streams of the Smoky. So that kind of, that pushed it right there. And it was just every weekend we were up there. If it was, it, it was either, you know, nine months out of the year, uh, eight months out of the year, we would try to slide up there. For the other three months, we were somewhere duck hunting. Um, so I was always either on a pond somewhere with him in the woods deer hunting, or uh, I was on I was in the mountains with him. So that kind of started it. Um, so I guess I would my my simple answer would be Walker K Chronicles uh, is kind of what got me started into it. Yeah, that's really neat, and it's really clear you have a special sporting relationship with your dad. Who are some of the other folks that have mentored you on your fly fishing journey, and what did they teach you? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's kind of funny that back when I started, there weren't really a, a lot of people that we knew, just because we were so involved in the bass world. We didn't really know a lot of, a lot of folks that even knew anything about fly fishing had fly rods nothing um we kind of just went out and and uh failed on our own and did it enough and and that kind of you know led us to stopping out little river outfitters and so i would say those guys are probably the ones that really helped us get into it and kind of showed us the ropes what we needed to do and, and whatnot and it with those guys it wasn't really about like hey we're just trying to sell you guys stuff uh, because we want you to be just customers. Um, they actually kind of broke things down and spent time with us um, every trip. You know, uh, even Daniel Drake, who, who's one of the owners there, you know, when, when I was a kid, he was there, and he was he was helping me figure things out. And so um, that, and, and you know, we, we had a couple of uh, 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 guys that, that long time ago, they, they were – guys in the park and an older gentleman that we had just come across while fishing that kind of gave us some tips and you know helped us kind of approach the stream a little bit differently and um there's uh, uh one guy named tim that was that was a guide up there he um he he was pretty helpful in in getting us uh kind of centered on how to approach the stream not just walking into it and fishing, but kind of had a, had to read it a little bit more, you know, taking your time. Um, a guy named Jack Gregory, uh, who, who wasn't a guide, but just, just an awesome fisherman. Um, who, you know, probably if, if you've caught a big fish in the Smokies, there's a good chance that, uh, he, he had some influence on that. Um, I know he did for me. And so, so, you know, a lot of, a lot of, the the guys at the shop and just people that we've run into while fishing um some just random strangers that gave us some tips but other than that you know it's, 
it's kind of something that we took on ourselves and just kind of just kind of learned it as we went. Yeah, very neat. When did you get the guide bug? That was that was probably uh, let's see here back in two thousand early two thousands, I guess. Maybe two thousand six or seven is when I started. Um, I knew I want so my my friend Michael and I back in middle school. Uh, I mean, his dad and my dad both fished tournaments together. So we were always fishing, riding our bikes to ponds and, and creeks and whatnot. Um, we always said we want to be pro fishermen. Always wanted to, you know, be in that lifestyle. Uh, then then we kind of realized that once we started fly fishing, there's really not like pro fly fishermen. I mean, I, I guess there is nowadays, but back then there wasn't. And so um, I didn't even think about being a guide but I knew I wanted to do something in the outdoors and it was probably 2006. I think it was, um, 2000, I think it was 2006. Uh, I was approached by a guy at a uh, lodge up here and, um, he said, you know, they, they did, they did some kind of, uh, uh, trips on a Creek that they stopped. And they said that we need, you know, some extra guys because, in the summertime, we get more people and we would like, uh, we'd like some help. And, and so that kind of, I got my foot in the door and then that kind of led to me, you know, start my own company. Yeah, really neat. And, you know, cause I guess you did that for what, three or four years and then you started frontier anglers. Yeah. Yeah. So I, for, for about, I think it was like two years we did it and, and, and it was just, I was looking to try to do something a little different. So, uh, being from the bass world, getting into the fly fishing world, and, you know, Tennessee is just a huge destination for smallmouth. Um, I actually grew up right down the road from the Little River uh, here in Maryville. And the Little River has smallmouth in it. It's got, you know, all sorts of different panfish and whatnot. And so I was always kind of down there in high school, playing around, catching smallmouth, started piddling with fly fishing a little bit. And then I, as I was, as I started guiding to that lodge, um, I kind of thought, you know, I, th- there's not a lot of folks guiding for smallmouth, um, but we have them everywhere. And, you know, the, the game is trout around here. You've got the Smoky Mountains, you've got the tailwaters, the, the clinch is known uh, for, its, for its state record brown trout. Um, so everybody's focus is on trout and, um, and don't get me wrong. I love trout, but I thought, man, nobody has gotten for smallmouth and it's, it's, it's such an awesome fish. And so we kind of, I kind of started doing a little bit more with smallmouth on my own as I was kind of leaving the lodge and doing my own thing. It just kind of led into, you know, we, we just did smallmouth and, uh, I was getting, I was getting more people to do that over trout and, uh, and it's kind of led us to where we are today. And that was probably, we started our, we started our guide service, um, in 2008, I believe. Yeah. It's 2008. And, you know, it's, it's progressively grown since then. And, you know, we've got, we've got some great guys working with us now. Um, Gary Troutman, Chris Wright, and Doug Moore and uh, those guys are all professional and they're they're um, uh, very personable guys and they know their stuff and love being on the water. So you know, there's there's been some other guys over the years who have helped us out, you know, a, a little bit at a time. And, and so um, to be able to find some guys who are trustworthy and and uh, you know, the, the the biggest thing is they show up, they show up on time. Um, they, they have boxes full of flies, rods rigged and ready to go. Like they want to be there. Um, that, that is, uh, to me, that's the biggest deal. Um, and so it's, you know, it's been a, it's been a huge blessing. Yeah. That's really awesome. And so did you have to kind of figure out the guide and then they kind of, I, I don't think we officially have outfitters in this part of the world, but you're really an outfitter if you're running, you know, almost a half a dozen guides, did you kind of have to figure that out on your own or do you have some people that kind of helped you along the way? 
you know, I had some buddies that guided in other places and they had some guys working for them. Um, they, you know, and it's, and it's one of those things where it's not a typical nine to five. And so I think you just, I just had to get out of that mindset of, you know, you're an employer and it's, it's not like it's a, it's a very unique business. So these guys don't necessarily work for us as much as they work with us. Um, I mean, they, they, they specifically work with our company, but, you know, I give them free range if they want to take trips, if they don't, um, they tell me, Hey, I've got people coming in town and we just kind of work together as a team on that. But it's, it definitely, there was some influence from some of my buddies. Uh, one of my buddies, Patrick up in, um, uh, Bristol, you know, he runs, uh, uh, South Olson river company and he, he runs, he's got a bunch of guys working for him. Um, and so, you know, we talk a bunch about business and techniques and, and things like that. You know, it's important to um, to kind of have that connection with other guides and, and, and not just guides, but other, you know, um, kind of different businesses. Um, actually, one of the, the uh, guide services in the uh, Smokies for hiking, I talked to them and, you know, we kind of talked about different things, but. It's, it's definitely not your, your typical nine to five that, you know, you're clocking in, you're clocking out. Your, your day really stops when you get to sleep. Um, because like last, last night, me and one of our other guys, Gary, uh, we were talking at 11 o'clock at night and both of us were tying cicada patterns. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you, there's always something to do whether it's tying up leaders, whether it's making flies, whether it's, you know, getting stuff done uh, on the boat. And um, so, yeah, I mean, but we've, we've definitely had some good people backing us up and helping us along the way for sure. Yeah. And I know it helps too, to have, you know, four to six people kind of in your umbrella and then people like Patrick Fulkride where you can kind of talk about what's going on so you can kind of get things dialed in for your clients a little bit better. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and we have people that we both fish with back and forth that'll, that'll come down here to get something a little different, but that, you know, they'll go up there because they love the South Holston. And, um, it is, it's nice. It's nice to, to have relationships with other guys. Uh, I know that, um, there's, there's that, I don't know if it's necessarily like a, a, a toxic, um, deal with other guys out West. Um, and, and not necessarily, but, but like I've been in a boat, um, on the snake river, uh, several years ago, me and my buddy and, you know, our guide and another guide got into an altercation. And so we don't, we don't have that around here. It's very laid back. It's calm there. You know, most of us are all buddies and, you know, people fish in between us. And so, um, so it's, it's a little different around here. Yeah, it's funny while you were telling that story, it made me think I was fishing down uh for uh for redfish uh in in Beaufort and then we had another guy literally blow up in a flat in a boat and push water into us and yell at us and then motor away. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean <laughs> Life's too short. And 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 you kinda think to yourself, and he thinks we're in the wrong. You know, I mean so I, I don't know, you know, pe- people are driven by different things, and especially now, you know, it seems like um, whether it's fishing, hunting, anything, people are with, with 2020 just kind of being a disaster um, all around. People's tempers are high. And anyways, it just, um, if anything, it just helps us to, uh, you know, learn how to deal with different situations and different people. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to stay away from some of those people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. I wanted to talk to you just to kind of let folks know, cause I know, you know, I've been lucky over my fishing career to fish with a lot of different people, you know, to let folks know kind of what a day on the water is like with you or one of your other guides. Sure. Yeah. Um, we, we have, so in our area, we have, uh, a, a different river system. So, you know, a lot, a lot of tailwaters uh, in our area are run by TBA. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the questions that we get are where do we meet 
and what time? And that question could come up a month in advance. We try to just tell them, you know, around here you have to be flexible. Um, we don't know what TVA is going to run um, on a particular day. They give a projected flow of what they're planning on running, but um, we, we get a lot of rain in this area. So, uh, number one, you know, we always just try to tell people, be flexible if, if at all possible, you know, and um, – and the good thing is that there's so many rivers around here to fish that there's always an option. Two, we try to always be uh, 15 minutes early because uh, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. That's what my dad always used to teach me. And so um, we, we always are punctual. We have rods rigged, ready to fish, uh, boats clean, you know, cooler full of drinks. And the biggest thing is when we – or fishing with somebody, especially somebody new, um, just ask them what they want to get into. You know, what are you looking for? Are you, are you want to chase one trophy? Uh, are you wanting to just catch numbers? Is this something you're going to do one time and, you know, you just want to have fun? Uh, just try to, try to feel the person out, really, and kind of get to know them and where they come from a little bit. Um, but, but with us, we try to just make it as fun as possible. Um, and I know that, you know, everybody's like, oh, that's what every guy says. But but it really is. I mean, in the end, you know, you, you kind of look back and though it's awesome to have a picture as a huge fish or you can go back and go, I literally caught 80 to 100 fish that day. It was unreal. Everybody remembers something weird about that trip. Um, and so, you know, there there's there's always these situations that come up that you know just just like that guide in the temper your guide could have yelled back at him and that's the one thing you remember from that trip how your guides got into it just like mine um instead you know you you've got a positive thing to remember about your trip so we definitely try to focus on that um we try to do different different things you know uh, again in our area there's really nobody else guiding for smallmouth and so um that's a cool thing that we have in our area that that people are um, that that they don't really know at first, but then they come here and they're like, "Wow, you know, Tennessee's got a lot of smallmouth." I said, "Yeah, you know, we um, and and not only do we have a lot of smallmouth, we have very cool uh, and and unique conditions for smallmouth." Um, so when you think of smallmouth, what you think of is you know kind of dirty rivers of the Midwest um, um, with. Uh, brown water and you know the the, the flatlands and things like that where well, we are um a lot of things around us are mountains and and you know we've got some sections that are flat some rapids uh we've got very clear water and you know what's cool about our area is where we are in the country we're so far south that our season starts earlier so like right now we're already catching smallmouth and though we haven't started catching them on top water, that's probably the you know the biggest thing of, about smallmouth fishing, um, um, as well as trout fishing too. I mean, you know, we've got a lot of bugs hatching right now in the park. The quill gordons and the blue quills are a big attraction this time of year. It's, it's the first bugs that that really hatch off in good numbers and and get the fish fired up. And so, you know, people are coming out of winter. And they're looking for something to do now that the weather's nicer. And here we have opportunities in the South to not only catch trout, but smallmouth. Um, get on them a little earlier. But um, one thing I wanted to, to touch back on with uh, the smallmouth is that it's, it's pretty neat that over the years people have said, you know, it's cool about your rivers is they're gin clear. So you get a, a lot of the strikes and a lot of the um, topwater uh, eats are all visual. Um, and I know a, a topwater eat, no matter where you're at, is visual. Uh, ours is visual from 15, 20 feet away from the popper. We can actually see the fish coming at it and stare at it. And like, it, you know, you get to see play by play. And so it's, it's really unique. And a lot of people get, uh, get a kick out of it. Yeah. It's neat too. Like when you, like you pull like a white game changer and it just disappears, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's exactly. I mean, it, 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 I mean, white is a, it's a huge color. So anything visual, uh, people actually ask us a lot of times why we fish white. 
uh, for that reason right there, because you can see it, fish can see it, and um, and it's fun. You know, a, a lot of times uh, a fish, a smallmouth especially, is going to come up to a, to a streamer and eat it, but not necessarily run away. So if, if you don't have a consistently tight line to it, which you, you never do, you always have a pause in between the strips, you, you might not feel that strike, and he's going to toss it. Um, so, I mean, a, a white streamer is, uh, uh, even growing up, you know, fishing a white fluke or uh, a white spinnerbait, you know, it, it was always fun. So, yeah, that's definitely, especially in clear water, um, where you can see them coming from a ways off. That's definitely a uh, a cool thing that our area has to offer. Yeah, it's neat. I know, like, you know, in the mid-Atlantic, the we're kind of starting to get geared up for kind of pre-spawn smallmouth. Are your smallies already on the spawn? No, they haven't started spawning yet. Um, our, and, again, ours varies because our, our springs will either be cold, they'll, they'll be uh, hot. I mean, right now we're getting a lot of rain, so – uh, there typically it's a little bit later in the spring when our spawn, but right now, I mean, they're, they're still, they're right on the tipping point of coming out of wintering holes, um, and, uh, you know, getting up on the shallows, uh, they're, they're more aggressive. They're not nearly as, as bunched up. And so it is, it's, it's right there on the verge of it. So some days we'll have really nice sunny days and, and, you know, you can look at the water temperature, it's come up a few degrees, and you can notice it in the fish's uh, uh, activity. Uh, other days, like today, you know, we get a cold rain, and it chills that water off, and it puts them right back into a funk. Um, not to say that they won't eat, but it's just not as aggressive as maybe two days earlier. But it's coming. Uh, the, the spawn's not too far off. Um, they're definitely healthy. The, we, we've caught some pretty large fish already this year that were that were very healthy, um, good shape, uh, um, you know, hard fighters, and so we're we're seeing a pattern on several different places that we're fishing that went, that they're doing the exact same thing. So it's it's I mean I guess you you could you know making a uh, uh, I'm going a, the long way around a short answer, but the yes the the pre spawn is, is starting. Um, but it, you know, I guess you can say it, it started a month ago, but we're, we're just now getting into the, the time when we're getting more reliable flows to actually act on it and go after them because we've had flooding nonstop. Uh, one of our big rivers, uh, the French broad has been rolling at 18 to 20,000 for a month, uh, two months. And, you know, it's just now showing signs of release. Um, some of our freestone streams are now coming down. Um, but as they're coming down here, we're getting a bunch of rain the next couple of days. So, you know, but the good thing is in, in our area, we don't get flooded for very long. It may take a day or two and we're usually back to, you know, hitting the river, running trips. So it's, it's pretty unique. Yeah. And so, you know, you're starting a little bit earlier, you know, than like our friends in the upper Midwest, you know, how late into September and October are you able to consistently fish for smallies? Uh, well, you know, we're actually fishing for them sometimes almost, uh, up to Thanksgiving. So our season lasts quite a bit longer than most people's. And, um, and the reason is, is because, uh, our, our rivers stay warmer longer. And so, though the the uh, uh, the food sources might start uh, to dissipate or disappear, they we actually will get um, quite a few bait fish to push in to the river. So it kind of gives them like one good last meal uh, that that will last all the way into the fall, uh, late fall. Um, and that's not I, and, and don't get me wrong, that's not a common occurrence that we're fishing all the way to Thanksgiving. But, I mean, we fish them all through the winter as well. But, like, we, we pretty well are done taking trips for smallmouth in about early to mid-November. Um, and, and really it's because, it's you know, it starts getting colder, the days are shorter, um, your window for active fish starts to get less and less. And so it's not necessarily the fact that we can't catch them it's just that it's a combination of things where, um, 
you know, you're, you don't really want to take somebody out on a day when they might only have a good couple of hours. Yep. Unless that person says, I want a good couple of hours and that's it. <laughs> so, um, we try, we try to do our best to, you know, take care of our folks and especially, you know, when folks have traveled a long ways to come here, we want to do them right, take them out on a fun day and, uh, make sure that they get their, their time worth, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, given the fact that you have a longer season, does that translate into your small mouth being different than the ones in the upper Midwest or what we think of like in Virginia and up in Pennsylvania, are they bigger or more aggressive or. Um, I would say overall. Um, and I know that I've, I've caught them up North. I've caught them, um, uh, in the Midwest, all, uh, great fisheries. And, you know, every, every water has kind of its own specific special thing. Um, I, I would say though, that where we are and, and, you know, where their native range is us being right at the tail of it is definitely our longer season. Um, the food sources stay out longer. The, um, the, the fish themselves stay out longer. Uh, they, they get a little bit bigger. Um, there's, there's more bodies of water with them in it. So, uh, or within the bodies of water. So, you know, we've, our growing season on certain rivers is, I mean, you could, you could technically say that it's 12 months a year. And as to where a lot of places get so cold, you know, they'll lock up and, and they'll go into winter mode. Um, ours do have that winter mode as well. Uh, and, and they're definitely less aggressive, but I would say that you're probably looking at about a 10 month season. If you're a hardcore smallmouth fisherman here, um, you, you could do it year round again, but 10 months of, of probably active smallmouth fishing. So with that being said that the, the, the fish just had more time to grow. Um, they've got, you know, uh, uh, Tennessee, has more species of crawdads than any other state in the country. So, you know, we, we have, we have so much food for them and such a longer growing season that that's kind of, um, it's a, a 20 inch smallmouth is not necessarily a rare occurrence. Um, it's always uh, a special day when somebody catches a citation, but you know, for somebody to catch a 21, a 22 or a 23 inch fish, um, it's like, yeah, you know, that, that can happen in Tennessee. Yeah, very neat. Do you have a favorite way you like to fish for them? Uh, I mean, I think, I don't think I'm any different than anybody else, you know, top water. Who, who doesn't love a, a, a big, dark smallmouth coming up and sipping a top water? So, you know, especially, you know, this year, uh, they're predicting our area to get a, a periodic, periodical cicada hatch. So, I mean, being a topwater lover, that's this is like a, a dream coming true now. Um, it's a 17 year, so I remember the 13 year and how crazy things got then. So I'm really hoping that we get it. Uh, I think the, the folks fishing with us are going to have an absolute ball if that happens. Um, I think it's going to make the the rivers a little crazier this year. But um, but yeah, definitely topwater. Um, I'm a popper guy. I love time poppers. Um, I love time poppers out of you know, several different materials from deer hair to balsa wood. Um, and, uh, the ladies at the, uh, Sally Hansen shop know me pretty well. Cause, uh, I've got a, I've got a pretty big selection of nail polish that I paint my poppers with. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So do you have a favorite style? Do you like sliders or chuggers? What's your favorite style of popper? Man, I'm, I'm a chugger. I like, I like a good, uh, top bar though. I wouldn't say that we necessarily, you know, are, are chugging them, um, again, because our water is being shallow and clear. Sometimes that can, uh, you know, a hard pop can actually spook them. But, um, but I, I do like that style. Um, I like to be able to make noise if I want to, you know, if I've got one off in the distance, you can pop it and, and bring them to it. Um, I like, I like one that, um, uh, has a little bit of weight to it sometimes, you know, just the sound of it hitting can get them uh, to come up. So, you know, something like uh, um, a boogle bug, you know, it's, it's, it's a great popper. It makes a good sound. It's got a good look to it. Um, time in a bunch of different colors. Um, 
So that that's all. That's kind of my favorite style. Uh, just like a lot, of, I'm sure. Um, and then if I, you know, if if I had to pick another, um, I love tying with foam. So I love tying terrestrial patterns. And I've got a few that we tie for small mouth that um, those days when they kind of, uh, you know, they, they look at a popper for the hundredth day in a row and it's kind of like, oh gosh, I'm not Um I like to be able to throw them something a little different that, you know, you, you look on your desk and you've got some foam and rubber legs and, um, you know, some stuff to make a wing pattern with. You know, it's, it's kind of it's kind of cool that you can you can play around with stuff like that and um, and still attract one to it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, before we talk a little bit about fishing in the park, I did want to talk to you about uh, being selected as the Orvis Freshwater Guide of the Year last year, and you know that's a big deal. And I was wondering if you could share with our listeners kind of the selection process and what the award means to you. Oh man, it's you know um, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, we've we've been with Orvis for I think like three this is maybe our fourth season with Orvis and for years I had a buddy um who was an Orvis guide and he said you know you should really get involved with Orvis it's a great company and and um it it really didn't seem like something I wanted to get involved in you know I like I want to be in more of the the small town guide community not necessarily the corporate guide community um, the more I looked into it, 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 it wasn't the corporate world at all. Um, and you know, my buddy said, listen, try it out. If you don't like it, drop it. Um, but, but try it out. And it's such a good company to work with. Uh, we have a local store here in Sevierville. Uh, all the guys, uh, that are there, Jake, Vic, Jeremy, all of them are, are great guys. They always help us out with stuff. Um, you know, if, if I need, if I need something like, Hey, we broke a rod. They've always told me, come get one, man. You know, whatever you need for your trip, come get it. Um, so it's been an awesome company that to, uh, to work with. And, you know, when, when they told us, Hey, you got nominated for the guy of the year, I thought, I, I honestly thought it was a joke. Um, I thought my buddy was messing with me. And, and then I got a call and they were like, Hey man, you know, congratulations. And I thought, well, that's, that's really cool. Like I was kind of in shock a little bit. Um, I, I don't know the selection process. Uh, you know, I, after after we won it, I kind of tried to go back and think there's got to be some kind of algorithm for this that they choose or whatever. And and the, as far as I can tell, you know, I'm I'm still at a loss. I have I have no idea how they choose you. Um, but we we were very honored to get it, and uh, you know, to to actually even be in the same realm of some really awesome guys that I've followed over the years was, was kind of like, um, I don't know, is it, it was kind of a, a weird moment to get up there and be like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you guys. Okay. I didn't feel like that, but, uh, we're again, you know, it's just little old Maryville, Tennessee, um, and around some of these other, you know, big name areas that are, that are so well known for fishing. So, uh, yeah, we're we're pretty excited about it, and um, I just, you know, couldn't be more thankful for them choosing us. So, yeah, it's super cool. Particularly, I mean, you're a pretty young guy, and your guide company's, you know, barely more than ten years old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it. I mean, it's it it was for sure, especially um, just because I've known other guys that you know have have been with Orvis for a while, and uh, and just to even get nominated is a, is a big deal. Um, so it was, and it was kind of funny that the day that we found out about it, um, my, <laughs> we were, we were smallmouth fishing on a river and, you know, I never had my phone on me. Um, I just, I don't want my phone on. I don't want interruptions. I don't want them to think that, you know, my time and me talking to people on the phone is more valuable than their time. Um, so I always try to put it away, but it must have leaned down up against my, uh, my rower spot and it was on vibrate and I could just hear it vibrate nonstop. And so when I picked it up, there were, there was text messages. Just all my buddies like, Hey man, congratulations, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, the heck are they talking about? You know, and, and I don't want to be on my phone. So I put it back in my box and it just keeps on going. And so, um, 
I just kind of picked it up and looked at it and put it back down. And I was like, no way. Huh. Okay. And so I just kind of ignored that and went on with the rest of the trip. Um, and then when I got home, you know, we kind of, we celebrated. Um, I mean, it was a pretty big moment for us. So we, uh, it was just pretty cool. And we're definitely glad that, um, we got on with the Orvis group because again, um, I mean, even some of the, the guys up north that work at the headquarters, you know, we, we've got some close relationships with them. And um, and so just kind of knowing, you know, what's coming out or or maybe what some ideas are for new products uh, that they're looking at, um, going to the, the OGR, the Orvis Guide Rendezvous, you get to m- meet a lot of people and connect with other guides from all over the country. Um, heck, I, I mean, there were even guides from Belize down there or over there in, in Montana last year. So, you know, um, some of which we actually fished with the same people. So it's kind of cool. We got to talk about, you know, stories of certain guys or, or women that we fished with over the years uh, to one another and to know that they never change <laughs> between fishing guys is kind of cool. Yeah, that's super neat. And so shifting gears, cause we have to talk about trout, right? Cause you're in such a great trout sure, spot. Yeah, um, and so, you know, this is an, an incredibly overbroad question, but you know, for people that don't know, can you kind of give them a, you, you know, a 30,000 foot view of what fishing opportunities there are in the park? Um, you know, cause I think most people know about the brook trout game, but I mean, I mean, there's, I think there are thousands of miles of wild trout water, right? There's, there's, so everywhere you see, there's going to, you'll, you'll see the number 800, 800 miles of, tr- of trout water, fishable trout water. Um, and yes, I mean, there's, there's probably, um, some of those probably aren't what you would most would consider trout water. You know, they do have some in it. Um, the brook trout is definitely a big draw to the, uh, Smoky Mountain National Park, especially because it's a Southern Appalachian brook trout. So it's a very special strain of that trout. Um, and you know, you can ask anybody in this area, of course, we're going to be a little biased towards it, but it's, it's definitely a special fish because, um, it's so beautiful. There's, there's tons of color on it and where they live, what they, what they have been through, um, from logging and, um, um, and kind of, you know, destroying the park yet they've still survived. So it, it's a it's a cool thing um, that's that's special to this area, and like you said, there's definitely more opportunities to fish in the park. Um, there, there's and the best part about it is that it's all public. So you know you find a body of water, you can pull over and fish it. Um, it's it's what it's there for, and most people that come here are, you know, they're they're not even looking at I want a big number day. I want a huge fish. Um, I think if you're if you're looking for a huge fish, the Smoky Mountains is not your place to fish. Um, though it can happen, uh, and it does happen occasionally, you never come here looking for it. And so I think that's that's definitely a big thing um, that that we appreciate is is the fact that we have so much water. It's all fair game. It, a lot of it has trout in it. And, um, the, the bug life, you know, we have very unique hatches. Like right now we're experiencing the quill Gordon hatch and the blue quill hatch. Um, we have uh, a few cats popping off and stone flies, but the main attraction is the quill Gordon. It's a big mayfly. So it's number 12. And so, uh, you know, you, you, you've got big bushy dry flies that eat your trout that have been sitting in wintering holes that haven't seen much food are now coming up and, you know, crashing on the surface. Um, mix that with not that many people in the park right now because it's still kind of cold and you've got a really fun day on the water. Uh, the, you know, um, there's there's definitely uh, uh, several um, places that we like to go that we can specifically target brown. And so from what I understand... Um, talking to some of the old timers and some of the park biologists and whatnot, uh, the Tennessee side of the Smokies has never been stocked officially by the park uh, with brown trout. It was more the North Carolina side. And um, as they call them, bucket biologists <laughs> brought the browns over to the Tennessee side. 
so, you know, I've, I've heard that from several guys that work for the National Park Service. Uh, whether or not it's true, I don't know. But um, we we do have browns. We've got rainbows. We've got brook trout. And um, and there's uh, me and a guy actually had a conversation one time that every now and then you catch a rainbow and he's he's got what looks like a little cutthroat uh, uh, gill flash on him. And, you know, we don't have cutthroat here. Uh, it's, it's just they, they don't live here. They've never been stalked, right? Um, but he said he was at, I believe it was the uh, uh, Fly Fishing Museum, and he, he found this little note on the wall that actually said how there were a few cutthroat that were put in over the years. Um, and again, I've not seen that note. I can't confirm that. I'm just saying what I've what I've heard from the others, but uh, I do know that it's something that that I've done since I was a little kid with my dad, and I was just in the park this week with uh, a couple of guys, and it you know it's just as fun now as it was back then. In fact, one of the um, uh, one of the trips I've taken out recently was with an 11 year old boy, and him and him and his mom and and uh, dad, and to see that kid light up when he caught one, it's just as fun for me. I'm 35. Uh, so it, it, it's it's uh, a lot a lot of camping around. You know, you can do backcountry trips, um, uh, and that's you know a lot of times that's where you're going to find your brook trout, uh, but not just brook trout, rainbows and browns too. Uh, but, it, but you know, it's it's just it's one of those things that I think people. Um, it's it's definitely a trout destination. Uh, it's it's a it's a wild trout fishery on the east coast, and so. Um, it's very, especially growing up here, we all always took it for granted that, you know, we've, we've got such a cool resource in our backyard. Now I know that. Um, but when I was a kid, I used to always want to travel and go different places and, and, you know, even, even live in other places because I thought there might be more out there. But as you go out there, you realize you kind of lived in paradise. So there's really nowhere that you need to go. Um, but it's, it's a special place and, you know, uh, uh, one of the um, best hatches is yet to come, which is the yellow sally. So, you know, uh, every, everybody likes to, you know, dress the part right. Everybody likes to look like a fly fisherman and wear the waders and wear the vest and all that stuff. But one of the cool things about the Smokies is in the summertime, you know, take the waders off, take the vest off. Just take one small box of yellow stoneflies. And put on your wading boots or your chacos, and take one small rod and hit the trail. Uh, it's, it's it's a lot of fun in the summertime. It's a good way to stay cool, and um, you know it's it's one of those hatches that when it comes off, you know there it's fast if you're fishing. Um, it's a small, brightly colored bug, so uh, I mean it's you know you, you, they've got to eat quite a few of them, and uh, as as a uh, <laughs> as a Smoky Mountain uh, uh, relic up here, as Walter Babb says, uh, I don't think a, a trout in the Smokies can get full. So it's it's um, a pretty cool place, and there's lots and lots of, of, of places to go and venture and see. And um, you know, every stream seems like it's a little bit different. One of my favorite streams is Abrams Creek. Uh, Abrams Creek fishes to me completely differently than um, any of the branches of the little river or the West Prom and the little pigeon river that, that um, are above Gallenberg. And so the O'Connell Lusty in North Carolina, it, it fishes to me different than uh, the little river. So it's kind of neat how you can go from one uh, watershed to another and, and see differences. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, also for, for folks that, you know, aren't in our part of the world and haven't been to the park before, you know, it's not just the fishing that makes that part of the world special. You want to talk a little bit about, you know, what makes that Western North Carolina, you know, Eastern Tennessee place such a neat place, not just for fishing, but for so many other things. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, uh, one big attraction and probably the, one of the most visited places in the national park is Cades Cove and Cades Cove is an 11 mile loop that you can drive. You can, you can walk around, you can ride a bike and, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, place to view wildlife. So on any given day, 
again, back, back when I was a kid, my parents and I would go up there and we would just drive around the loop and see how many deer we could count. Um, this time of year, you're going to see turkey out. You know, you're going to see a big tom strutting in front of his hen. And uh, it's really cool. And, and again, it's, it's something free to do that you can go in there. Uh, Western North Carolina has, you know, uh, quite a few elk um, that are that are really neat to go out and see. And, and, you know, we don't have them on our side. So it's kind of neat for even for us to, to travel over the mountain and go see those uh, elk, especially in the fall. Um, and, you know, here, here in Bugling, there's, there's tons of wildflowers. You know, people come from all over to see the wildflowers, the rhododendrons blooming, um, which, which kind of just happens to be uh, a, a, along the rivers a lot of the time. So as you're fishing and you know, you're fishing around um, what essentially is the undergrowth of when they log the, the park. And it's a beautiful flower. It's a, it's a big bloom. And they're, it's very uh, uh, colorful. And, and it's just, it's, it's neat to uh, see all the, uh, uh, the hiking opportunities that we have. We have um, uh, th- uh, a little over a thousand miles of hiking trails. And so uh, I've known several, several people that have, uh, are in a club where they've hiked every trail in the smoke. Some, some they've hiked them twice. And, um, you know, of course, the backpacking, uh, like I mentioned before. There's just there's so much to do in the Smokies, and uh, one thing that's always been popular, and it's now almost, I mean, even for us locals here, you know, it's hard for us to get into it, but uh, we have the synchronous fireflies. So the, the, the fly, fireflies, when they're mating, they, they kind of do this thing where they all will kind of flash together at one time, um, just loads of them, and you can go up into the Elmont campground and, and see uh, fireflies all light up at one time. And there's only a few places in the whole world that it happens in, in, in that volume. And one of them is, uh, here in the Smokies. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, I, I could, I could go on and on about, you know, things to do here and, and places to stay. Um, just think we ought to, we ought to let people, uh, come over here and experience it themselves. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a neat place. Like I told you before we started recording, I always try to come in the fall and uh, and try to fish every year. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's neat. The fireflies are super neat. Um, it's just a it's a really special part of the world. Yeah, and and um, you know, it's actually it, again it's going back to the fishing side of it. Not just the the fish themselves, but it's a cool way to see the park. Um outside of how other people see it. So a lot of people that will drive right through the park, you know, going from Gatlinburg to North Carolina. And, you know, that was there. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's their experience of the Smokies. Getting in the stream, though, um, and I can't, I can't believe I didn't mention it, but the blight bears, you know, you can, you can see blight bears in Cades Cove almost every day uh, during the spring and summer. And so, um funny enough and this sounds crazy but as many times i've been up to, to abrams creek in cage cove <clears throat> i have never seen a black bear in cage cove and people tell me all the time they you know they're like oh wow we saw four today um people that don't know the area but it, it just seems like every time i see something cool in the in the uh, smokies it's while i'm fishing um i've stumbled upon bears while i'm fishing i've had bobcats walk up on me um, you know, the, uh, river otters, river otters are not scared of you and they'll come right through your run while you're fishing. It's really cool. And a lot of people that don't get out of the car, uh, will never experience that. So, um, when you're kind of in that environment with them, not just seeing it from the road, it kind of puts it into a different perspective. Yeah. It's interesting too, you know, when you get off the beaten path like that, cause you know, sometimes you can, you know, you feel like something's watching you and that's when you see the wildlife. <laughs> um, or, you know, I've certainly had the experience where, you know, like you can smell the deer, but you can't see them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a super neat experience, but you know, you don't just, uh, guide in the park. You also float for trout outside the park. You know, what's that experience like? 
Yeah, we uh, we have in the Knoxville area. We have two uh, great rivers. One's the Clinch River, um, uh, which uh, I talked about earlier, which has you know the state record brown trout. Um, we also have the Holston River, and um, the Holston River, though the access is fairly limited, um, is a great trout river. Uh, the upper 18 uh, miles of it, and 20 miles if you want to stretch it out, is trout, and the lower 30 are smallmouth. But but the the trout waters themselves, um, you know, we have a great caddis hatch on it. Uh, we do get sulfurs, and um, uh, I'd say I'd say that the year round fishery though is the Clinch River, and it's it's um, what's cool about the Clinch is it fishes well on low water, it fishes well on high water. And and everything in between, um, it's got browns, it's got rainbows, uh, and and so, um, what a lot of people do, what we did today, you know, we were on the Clinch River and we nip fished uh, for the majority of the time, but you know, we actually ended up getting a few on streamers. So we have so many different options, and and you know, one of those, uh, um, like we said earlier too, about the about our area getting a lot of rain is if our rivers. In this area, get blown out. Um, you know, I can call one of my buddies and say, "Hey, how's how's the river up in your area?" And um, we could travel two hours and hit a different river. So within the within the Knoxville area, um, we have seven rivers that we float for trout and smallmouth, but um, two particular for trout that um, that grow trophy trout and uh, good numbers of trout. We have uh, we have hatches that we can um, target fish on on drives. So, which, which is a special thing, you know, if you've, if you've ever been on a big river and you see pods of fish rising, or you just say single fish rising, getting a, um, which is totally different from the Smokies, you know, we were making very short casts and you, you can't see the fish, um, until it comes up on these big rivers, you're making long casts. You're actually getting to, to, uh, drift a fly into the fish and watch him come up and slowly eat it. I mean, it's, it's pretty special. Um, but most of our fishing is nymph fishing, uh, just because, you know, the, the, um, it, it, an, an inexperienced angler is probably not going to be able to deliver a fly accurately at first, uh, without some sort of, of guidance with that. So, um, we do teach people how to do that. We work on skills while we're out there. But most of it is nymph and streamer fishing. And so um, we, uh, again, I mean, one of those things that, you know, I have, I have been able, fortunately, to, uh, to fish other rivers. And if I, if I, had, if I had one um, trout river to fish on, you know, if I, had, if I had one more day to live and one to fish, it would probably be the Clinch River. Uh, just because it's our home river. I know it well. Uh, it's beautiful. It's a lot of farmland. There's there's no development on it except for some homes that you see here and there. And uh, if I if there was one other river that I could fish, it would be the Snake, the South Fork of the Snake River in Idaho. And so um, going to all these places, you know, and then coming back home, it is. And everybody's going to be biased towards their water. You know, it's which which you grew up on. It's what you know. You're comfortable with it, um, but it's, it's to see beginners have great days on the water that can show you how good your water is as to where, you know, an experienced angler on a Western river, they get tumbled, um, which can happen to anybody any day. But, you know, it seems like on the Western rivers, there's, there's more days that I've been on it where you're humbled due to, you know, uh, cold snaps and wind and, and, um, the flows are off, uh, you know, it got flooded or it's too low or whatever. Uh, it just seems like our rivers aren't as, as fickle as those at times. And don't get me wrong. Um, uh, I love going out West. I'm not knocking Western rivers at all because if there's one state that I would live in other than Tennessee, it would be Idaho. But, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, we, we have some, some great spots that we can take people on the, um, uh, and, you know, one good thing about our area as well, being tailwaters, is that they're they're fishable year round. So, our water temperatures uh, vary from you know spring to fall, uh, but but generally stay around the fifty to to fifty five degree range. 
and and keep trout uh, year round and, and keep them healthy. So it's kind of nice to have that in your in your backyard, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny when you were saying that. It makes me think about when I fished the South Holston, and you can feel the cold air with the water coming downstream when they've done a release, and you're waiting for the water to get to you. Oh yeah, and you, you, you know, and you, the fog starts rolling in, and it's it's uh it's a it's a weird, uh, you know, if you've never seen that or experienced that, it is an odd feeling to just get a gust of wind coming. Um, and, to, and for somebody who's never fished a tailwater, you know, uh, one, <laughs> one of, uh, one of my favorite things is, you know, when, when, when you're anchored up and you've, you've been, uh, uh, fishing low water all day and, you know, I know that the water's coming up, but they don't necessarily know that. Um, it's to see somebody's first reaction when they go, Hey Josh, I, I think this water's coming up <laughs> and that, that provides me with an opportunity to mess with them. Yeah. And so, you know, um, which, which is perks of the job sometimes, but, um, though most people are good sports about that. And, and, uh, um, I will say that we, we actually don't do weight trips on the tailwaters and, and one reason for that is uh, just the fact that, you know, TVA will put up a disclaimer saying that there, if, if the water needs to be released due to uh, them needing extra power or needing to get rid of water or whatever, they can do so without letting you know. Um, and so for that reason, we've just made a decision that we don't do anything but float trip on our tailwaters because that way, if the water does come up, we're not in jeopardy. You know, we're, we're in a boat and we can rise with the water. We can fall with it. We can control, we can get to the, the bank quicker, you know? So, um, that is definitely one thing that we don't do is wade fish the tailwaters. Yeah. It's funny you say that. Cause when I would take people that had never fished the South Holston before, I was like, you know, when you feel that cold air and see the fog, you need to make sure you're on the, the side of the river you want to be on. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, that's a great point. Yeah. And yeah. keep an eye on something, you know, make sure that you've got, uh, set something on a rock upstream from you. Um, like a, like a, uh, a bottle or, or something in your, in your pack. That way, uh, when the water rises, it'll come floating by you. You'll know it. Um, keep your eye on something. It's very important because those tailwaters, uh, they can be dangerous if you're not careful. Yeah, there you go. And, you know, uh, Josh, before I let you, uh, get on with your evening tonight, um, I really appreciate you taking the time, but why don't you let folks know the best way to follow your fishing adventures online and also how to book you or one of your guides. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so you can visit our website at frontier anglers, TN for Tennessee.com. Um, so it's, you can go on there. You can actually, a lot of the way we book trips is through our website. Um, we have an easy system to, to set it up and whatnot. Um, we're kind of old school. We, uh, you know, a lot of us still like to just talk with people one-on-one before the trip. Um, I have, I have several people that call and say, Hey, um, you know, I went on there and wanted to book a trip, so we never found a calendar. Um, and the reason for that is I want to make sure that I get the trip lined up for you or one of my guides gets the trip lined up for you. Um, that you're looking for, you know, we've had people in the past say, Hey, I want to go trout fishing, um, on the tailwaters and, or I want to, I just want to go catch trout. And, you know, they would have booked a trout trip, uh, for the Smokies, but maybe they didn't want to go, uh, weight fishing. Maybe they wanted to go floating and they didn't know that. Um, even though we've got it, you know, we do have it listed. Uh, you can pick your trip that you want, but I, I just like to get people's idea. You know, again, that's, that's how, uh, uh, when we first started, you know, a lot of people didn't know we did smallmouth, And so it's, it's something that we just have always done. We like to be personable. Uh, I'm a talker. So, I mean, as you can tell, uh, I, I love talking with people and, um, meeting people. And so, um, so that's, that's one way for sure is our, our, uh, contact info is on there, phone numbers, emails, all that. Uh, you can see pictures of us on there as well. And, um, you know, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Uh, and, uh, um, so we, I mean, we stay pretty regular on our, on our stuff too. So you can see fish reports, what's going on. Um, we 
try to be as as current as possible. And um, we just have we have a lot of folks, and we know things are are busy this time of year for people, um, or, or they're just you know they're planning trips and doing whatever. So we try to throw that information out there in case they just want to see something real quick to kind of get an idea of what's going on. So, um, but I, I really appreciate you bringing me on and, and talking with me and letting me kind of share a little bit about our area and, and our uh, guide service and whatnot. So, um, you know, I, again, just thank you. Oh gosh, it's been my pleasure. And I'm going to drop all that good information in the show notes. So it'll make life easy for everybody. They'll be able to just click on a link and follow you on Instagram or Facebook or head right over to your website and uh, book you or one of your guys. And, you know, Josh, I really appreciate you making the time this evening. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. How you too, buddy? Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Get out there and catch a few. Tight lines, everybody.